You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie in the USA. And I'm Johanna in Austria. Thanks for joining us for another episode of your favorite international podcast. First of all, our apologies for not uploading a new episode last week. We had some scheduling difficulties. Uh, my husband, you know, was home for a couple of days and it, it just didn't work out. I hope you forgive us. But let me tell you one thing. Maybe it makes you feel a little bit better. My husband and I had a lovely time and it was a much needed little break. Yeah, we almost did it. We almost managed it. And then I got a last minute migraine. It was the right call for sure. For sure. Well, thank everybody for coming back to listen. And we especially would like to thank our newest Patreon members. And they are Morgan Pruitt, Candy Westerfield, The Thomas Family, Tracy Anderson, and Becca Rower. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Yeah, we are so grateful. Today is part two of our 27 Club series. And after today's episode, we're going to cover some other subjects, other topics, but then we will be coming back from time to time, covering other 27 club cases. We're just, we're not going to spend multiple weeks in a row. I think the nice nice thing is that you can listen, when we're done with all the members of the 27 club, you can listen to them in any order, however you like. You don't, it's not building up like our usual two-parters. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to be nice for us because sometimes we get stumped talking about, like, figuring out what we want to talk about. So... We know we can always go back. And originally we thought today that we'd be doing Hendrix and Janis Joplin, but the death of Jimi Hendrix, it has a lot more conspiracy theories, I think, surrounding it than a lot of the other cases do. Mm. And then in order to understand why these theories are so popular, you just need a little bit more background. So we're going to get into it. And just a quick content warning for today, obviously, um... We are going to be discussing substance abuse disorder, alcohol and drug addiction. And then when we talk about theories, we'll also be talking about murder, of course, but also suicide, self-harm, overdosing, this kind of thing. So please be aware of that. Johnny Allen Hendricks was born in Seattle on November 27, 1942. His father, James Allen Hendricks, who went by Al, had met his mother Lucille at a dance in Seattle in 1941, and they were married on March 31, 1942. Three days after the wedding, Al left his young, pregnant wife behind so he could begin basic army training in order to serve in World War II. Lucille, meanwhile, was not having an easy time of it. The subject of his mother is one that Jimmy never really wanted to discuss, and it's understandable. A lot of what you read is very unkind toward her as she had serious substance abuse issues, mostly alcohol, and for the most part, she left her baby in the care of her sister, other relatives or friends, neighbors, and this kind of situation is difficult for everyone, including the family that Jimmy stayed with for quite some time who had hoped to adopt him. They really loved him like their own. On September 1st, 1945, Al was honorably discharged from the U.S. Army, He initially, when he got home, he couldn't find his wife anywhere, but he did eventually track down his son, who was living in California, and when he found his son, he changed uh, his name from Johnny Hendricks to James Marshall Hendricks, and that was, he was naming his son after himself and after uh, Jimmy's uncle, his late brother. Part of the reason he allegedly changed his son's name was that he had heard rumors when he was in the army that maybe... Jimmy was not his child, and there were rumors that his wife had been repeatedly unfaithful, and maybe a man named, you guessed it, Johnny, was actually Jimmy's father. So that's partly why he decided to change his son's name and name him after himself. In 1948, his younger brother Leon was born, but things really weren't good at home. Both of his parents had serious issues with alcohol addiction, and Jimmy would hide in the closet during their fights. Sometimes he'd be sent off to stay with his father's parents. They were former vaudeville performers who lived in Vancouver, but there was never any stability in his life as a child. More siblings were born, but each of them was put up for adoption. Jimmy and Leon were constantly being separated to be cared for by others, and the threat of foster care was always looming. In 1951, when he was nine, Jimmy's parents divorced and his father was granted custody. 
In elementary school, the social worker noticed young Jimmy was never without a broom that he pretended was a guitar. And he was so attached to this broom, he had such a vivid imagination and was so obsessed with having a guitar that the social worker actually thought it was damaging him to not have a guitar. And so she tried to access funds for disadvantaged children to get him a guitar, but, you know, you can understand a guitar isn't really going to qualify as a need in that kind of situation. Fortunately, while cleaning out an apartment, his dad found a ukulele with one string and gave that to Jimmy, who started to play immediately. And one note at a time, he picked out all of his favorite songs, especially Elvis Presley. When Jimmy was 15, his mother's drinking caught up with her. She had damaged her liver and suffered a ruptured spleen. Lucille died in early 1958 at the age of 33. Jimmy and Leon didn't get to attend her funeral or her burial in a pauper's grave. Their father, in a just really chef's kiss display of how generational trauma turns into toxic masculinity, he explained, men don't cry, and then poured his boys each a shot of whiskey and taught them that this is how real men deal with grief. So later that year, Jimmy had finally scraped together enough money. He needed $5 to buy his first acoustic guitar. These days, that would be around $40 to $50. He couldn't read music, but he could play back what he'd heard, and he loved to watch live music to see how guitarists played, and he listened to the blues greats like B.B. King, Muddy Waters, and of course his idol, Robert Johnson. See, it all it all comes back. It all, it all comes back to the first one, Robert Johnson. I am not singing Celine Dion. They will flag us. All right. Soon he formed a band with friends, but the problem was you couldn't hear his acoustic guitar over all the other instruments. And so it's around this time that his father realized that this guitar business isn't just some passing fancy and finally buys him what he has been begging for since he could speak, an electric guitar. Only the white Supra Ozark he got was right-handed, and Jimmy was a lefty, despite his father allegedly hitting him with a belt in order to get him to eat and write with his right hand. But that was no problem for Jimmy. He just played the guitar upside down. So that's what happened to my mom. She's left-handed, and she does everything with her left hand except for writing, because her dad, my grandfather, forced her to use her right hand for writing. He... Yeah. It's very sad. It's very damaging and very unhealthy, actually. It is, absolutely. So he started to get into some gigs playing with bands around the Seattle area until he was 19, and that's when he got into trouble for joyriding in stolen cars. And the judge was like, listen, you have a choice here. You can go to prison or the army. It's not quite cake or death, but it's like prison or the army. And he followed in his father's footsteps and enrolled in the army. So after basic training, he was off to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where he was assigned to the 101st Airborne. I wonder if he heard about the Hopkinsville encounter when he was there. It was around that time. Uh, we can't know, but we do know that he hated the army. It was just ugh, so much yelling, honestly. He'd had enough of that during his childhood. So he wrote a letter to his father and begged him to send him his guitar, and his father obliged. And in November 1961, he met fellow Screaming Eagle and guitar player Billy Cox. Billy's quote about Jimmy playing is sort of one of the, my favorites that I found. Uh, he described him as a mix between John Lee Hooker and Beethoven. Cox and Hendrix would form a band, and they played on the bass clubs during the weekends. On January 11th, 1962, Jimmy completed his paratrooper training, and he was awarded the Screaming Eagles patch. And then the army was ready to get rid of him. He was a terrible soldier. Awful. Lousy shot. Often found napping. He missed bed checks. Everybody makes a huge deal about the fact he was caught masturbating in a bathroom, so we can't leave that out. But no, that's not why he left the army. He didn't get kicked out for masturbating. They were just basically of the opinion that the country would be safer if Jimi Hendrix was not part of its defense plan. I feel they'd feel the same way about me. So on June 29th, 1962, Hendrix was granted an honorable discharge. When Billy Cox was discharged from the army not that long after, he and Jimmy moved to Clarksville, Tennessee, where they formed a band they called the King Casuals. I think it was two Ks. And Jimmy learned to play with his teeth because that was a gimmick he'd seen. And anytime he saw something crazy like that, he had to try it for himself. Eventually, they made the move to Nashville and got a residency at the popular Club del Morocco. Jimmy would spend the next few years traveling around in the South playing clubs on what they called the Chitlin Circuit, 
And it was during these years that Jimmy performed as a backing musician for acts like Ike and Tina Turner and Sam Cooke. But Jimmy gets bored easily, and he's bored with the matching costumes the band members have to wear and the lack of creativity. And so he goes off on his own again. The first time I saw a photo of Jimi Hendrix from that time, I was... I don't want to say shocked. I also don't want to really say surprised, because we all know what the style was in the early 60s, right? Mm -hmm. But when you think Jimi Hendrix, you always think of a very flamboyant hippie style and not a suit and a tie. So it's kind of... There's this dissonance there. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was... Now I've got ZZ Top's sharp-dressed man in my head, but the man knew how to dress himself, right? Like He looked great. Everything. Yeah. He looked amazing. Every outfit, amazing. So he's he's tired of doing these backup backing gigs, you know, so he moves to Harlem. And the next month, February 1964, he wins first prize at the Apollo Theater Amateur Contest, which I think that's a big fucking deal, isn't it? So... He then started playing Harlem club circuits, and he sat in with a bunch of different bands. An old friend got him an audition to join the Isley Brothers as part of their band, and he was offered the job. He toured with them until, again, playing the same set night after night was just too much, and he left them and went to join Little Richard's band. But he was just a little too showy, and Little Richard did not like anyone upstaging him. Little Richard really did feel like Jimmy stole a lot of his moves. And he's not wrong, really, but I think Jimmy just picked up on certain moves and bits and gimmicks that different people use that he saw throughout his life and kind of picked the ones that fit him. Can you imagine how hard it must be to upstage Little Richard? Right. Like, <laughs> you don't know how badly I want to tip through through the tulips with you, but I can't. We will be shunned. <laughs> so... Jimmy started another band of his own called Jimmy James and the Blue Flames and Ooh, yeah. began playing <laughs> and began playing at Cafe Wa 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 Cafe Wa Wa Cafe Wa <laughs> Question mark in the village so it's W H A Cafe Wa Question mark Yeah I love it <laughs> Uh he recorded some tracks and there's a TV appearance of Little Richard and you can see him in the background which is so fun but that's all he is, uh, background music for the main act. One of these groups was Curtis Knight, and that is how Jimmy met Ed Jelpin. In October of 1965, Jelpin would sign Jimmy to a recording contract that was a super shitty deal, where for three years he had something like 1% of royalties, and in exchange he was paid $1 per song. The rest went to Jelpin. Jimmy's big break comes when Linda Keith, uh, which is the girlfriend of Keith Richards... <laughs> It's so funny though, right? right? Keith Richards and Linda Keith. I know. So, uh, Confusing. <laughs> girlfriend of Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones saw Hendrix at the Cheetah Club and she was just absolutely mesmerized by him. She couldn't believe he wasn't a huge star yet. So she introduced Jimmy to the Stones manager, Andrew Oldham, uh, who you may remember from our last episode, but Oldham wasn't that impressed and he was like, nah, thanks. Can you imagine? Whoops. Linda reminisces about discovering Jimmy and helping launch his career in an article by Edward Helmore for The Guardian. Quote, Linda's breakthrough came finally when she invited the Animals guitarist turned manager Jess Chandler down to see Hendrix play his regular mid-afternoon set at the Café Voir. Quote, You'd come out the bright sun into this cave of a room, then the stage lights would come up and there's Jimmy playing the opening chords of Hey Joe. Well, it was quite mind-blowing, and I'm not surprised he blew Jess's mind with the first chord. It even blew my mind, and I knew it was coming. End quote. Now, Jess had been the bass player for The Animals with singer Eric Burden. Listeners probably know the song The House of the Rising Sun. Quick side note here. Every time I watch the video of uh, House of the Rising Sun performed by The Animals, every fucking single time i'm still blown away when you see young eric burden and then he opens his mouth and that voice comes out of it. Yeah. It's, it's just so unexpected it is right okay but enough of that the animals had been touring and jess was getting fed up by those long exhausting tours and you know not making any real money and he wanted to start working more as a talent scout and a manager and in September of 1966, he signs Jimmy to a deal which involved Jimmy moving to the UK to form a band there, you know, in a country other than the one where he'd signed such a super shitty contract earlier. The first big decision Jazz made was to change Jimmy's name from 
Jimmy with the normal Jimmy, J-I-M-M-Y, to Jimmy, J-I-M-I, which is really a great decision, I think. Oh, yeah. And with Jazz recruiting the addition of Noel Redding on bass and Mitch Mitchell on drums, the Jimi Hendrix experience was born. Jimi had tried to get his army buddy bassist Cox to come to the UK with him when he moved there with Jazz, but Cox was broke and couldn't afford airfare, so he passed and wished Jimi good luck. The night Jimi arrived in the UK, Jazz took Jimi out to a London club to play a gig, and that's where he met hairdresser and DJ Kathy Etchingham. And the two soon became an item, and they would live together and stay together until 1969. Yeah. The other key figure to enter Jimmy's life about this time was Michael Jeffrey. He had been the animals manager, and he became co-manager of the Jimi Hendrix experience because he had the funds to get the band launched. Chaz had mixed feelings about that, but having Jeffrey on board meant that Chaz could produce more and Jeffrey could manage. There is one story that comes up really frequently about Jimmy's early career in the UK, and that is about Jimmy meeting Eric Clapton. So this is pretty soon after Hendrix had arrived in the UK, and Jimmy was still pretty unknown, but Chaz was a good promoter, and so people working in the music industry had heard about this new American guitar player and how amazing he is. So it's October 1966, and Chaz takes Jimmy to Central London Polytechnic in Regent Street. Lots of bands did shows for students there. My husband's favorite band, Pink Floyd, were formed at the Polytechnic, so huge musical history there. So Chaz takes Jimmy to go see Eric Clapton's band, Cream. Cream songs you probably know are Sunshine of Your Love and My Favorite, White Room. And he asks if Jimmy, who is a big Clapton fan, Like, is it cool if he jams with the band for a little bit? And this is kind of weird, right? Because Cream are huge. They're already making it. Hendrix is a complete unknown. But the band's like, uh, yeah, sure. He can play. And did he ever play? So there's a quote from Clapton. And he said, quote, he was very, very flash, even in the dressing room. He stood in front of the mirror, combing his hair and asked if he could jam. He played Killing Floor, a Howling Wolf number I'd always wanted to play, but which I'd never had the complete technique to do, end quote. So Chaz remembers this amazing performance, and then he goes backstage to talk to Clapton afterward. And Clapton was apparently pale and like chain smoking. And he looked at Chaz and he just said, you didn't tell me he was that fucking good. Which... <laughs> I mean, he was that fucking good, though. And the Jimi Hendrix experience just exploded into the UK music scene that fall. Their first single was Hey Joe, which spent over two months in the UK charts, followed by their first album, Are You Experienced?, which featured the songs Foxy Lady, Fire, Purple Haze, and The Wind Cries Mary. The album, of course, was an enormous hit, and the band was doing very well in the UK. The Beatles kept them from the number one spot. So speaking of the Beatles, one more fun story. So June 4th, 1967, Paul McCartney and George Harrison are at a club. They're at the Seville Theater in London, which was owned by the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. They had gone to see Jimmy do a performance. The Sgt. Pepper album had come out maximum three days earlier. It had only been available at most for three days. And so imagine their surprise when the show starts and Hendrick walks out on stage and starts playing Sgt. Pepper. McCartney said this about it, quote, The curtains flew back and he came walking forward playing Sgt. Pepper. It's a pretty major compliment in anyone's book. I put that down as one of the great honors of my career, end quote. So not long after, they came back to the USA to perform at the Monterey Pop Festival in June of 1967. The Pop Festival is in beautiful Monterey, California. Love it. I've only been once, but gorgeous. And also playing Monterey were The Who, The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Janis Joplin, so many, so many people. And Jimi Hendrix was originally not on the ticket. They weren't originally going to be playing, but the Beatles were. And Paul McCartney kept telling the organizers of the festival that they had to get the Jimi Hendrix experience to play. And they said, okay, fine, as long as Paul would be one of the event organizers. And he did. As a Beach Boys fan, I have to mention one thing. The Beach Boys 2 were scheduled to play at Monterey, but they didn't show up. 
At the time, Carl Wilson, who is the youngest Wilson brother, was in a dispute over his military service and they were worried that he would be arrested on stage. At least that's one of the stories concerning that story or that that incident. People believe different kind of things why they didn't show up. Mm. When they didn't show, Jimi Hendrix said that this was the last you would ever hear about surf music. <laughs> and he allegedly also said that the Beach Boys sound like a psychedelic barbershop quartet, which, honestly, fair enough. I mean, yeah, I'm not <laughs> mad about that one. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but back to Monterey. The Jimi Hendrix experience uh, were introduced by Brian Jones, who called Jimi the most exciting guitarist he had ever heard. The Monterey Pop Festival was also where Jimi infamously lit his guitar on fire at the end of his set. And suddenly, the Jimi Hendrix Experience was one of the most popular bands in the world. They were also among the top five or so highest earning bands, but Jimi and the rest of the band weren't seeing much of that money. Remember Michael Jeffrey? Remember how Jazz felt like they weren't making any money when he played with the animals? You read a lot that suggests their business manager was embezzling from them and stashing money in overseas banks. Jess apparently felt he'd done the same with the animals. There is no proof of this, however, and while it may be true, some also say that the manager making more than the band was more the norm back then. I know it was for Brian Epstein and the, the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Talking about the Beatles. For years, they only made one cent for every record sold. One cent between the four of them. So that cent was, was split. And... One could also make the argument that like the terrible contract he had signed with Ed Chelpin, this was more the norm back then. Bassist Noel Redding believed he was eventually dropped from the band before Woodstock because he dared ask where the money was going. And he was replaced with Jimmy's army buddy, Billy Cox. Cox was super happy to be back with Jimmy though. Quote, we were hooked at the hip musically, Cox says with a laugh. We'd been in the 101st Airborne together. 20 minutes after we first met, we were jamming. One reason that Jimmy called me after all those years is that my mind was an archive of the riffs that we had created in the past. End quote. So they played together with a few additional band members backing Jimmy at Woodstock. Uh, he was the closing act, by the way, uh, Sunday night, 18th of August 1969. And Hendrix's rendition of the Star Spangled Banner would be played in... 2011, Guitar World magazine named his performance of the Star Spangled Banner the greatest performance of all time. Hendrix collapsed from exhaustion after his set, and this would be kind of foreshadowing the grueling touring schedule he and the band would be facing next. Jimmy's last tour would be the Cry of Love tour. It began in April 1970 in California with shows almost every day, sometimes even two shows a day, and... Most of the shows were in the US, but Jimmy did travel overseas, performing two shows in Denmark, Sweden, England, and Hendrix was also the final act at the Isle of Wight Festival. The last performance of the tour was on 6th of September 1970 at the Love and Peace Festival in Fehrmann, West Germany. Some of the shows didn't go well and Cox had a nervous breakdown caused by a combination of stress and exhaustion fueled by a bad acid trip. With the remainder of the tour cancelled, Hendrix returned to London. All right. So we've covered rock and roll. Now it's time to talk about sex and drugs. So as far as women went, Jimmy's relationship with Kathy Etchingham does seem to be his most serious, healthy relationship. And that lasted from 1966 to 1969, about two and a half years. They lived together. Kathy had um, been with Brian Jones and Keith Moon of The Who before she met Jimmy. Many people do believe she was Jimmy's true love. Um, I think there's an argument that could be made that that's true. His flat on Brook Street, which is now actually a museum, along with the flat next door where Handel lived, he shared that with her, and it was the only place he really considered home. But she was getting pretty fed up with groupies, and once drugs came on the scene, she just sort of realized that this wasn't the life she wanted anymore. You know what I mean? But... Jimmy wouldn't spend any time alone and sad, really. He had a lot of ladies. One famous incident with a groupie was his meeting with Cynthia Blastercaster. So if you don't know her, she was an infamous groupie who, while attending art school, had the idea to mold and cast the penises of famous rock stars. 
On 25th of February 1968, she casted Hendrix, and she said this about the art project in an article by Carly Stern for the DailyMail.com. Quote, Casting Jimmy was too unreal. I just couldn't believe it was me and my girlfriends who made it up to his hotel room against all the other groupie competitions, quote, she recalled. The article goes on to say, quote, Cynthia was well known in the rock and roll world and in 1977 Gene Simmons of Kiss wrote a song about her called Plastercaster. But despite her fame, she couldn't get her own art exhibition for years. Corporate sponsorship is afraid of the penis, she said. She also sold limited editions of select casts including Jimi Hendrix and never got tired of seeing the originals on display in her home. They're like my pets. <laughs> They're like my pets. I have them in this room on pedestals and there's a warm yellowish tint in the room. It's like sitting in your living room with your pet kitties, she said. <laughs> End quote. Oh, it's such a good quote. They're just like my kitties. All right. Another groupie, super groupie, we should mention, is Devin Wilson. Yeah, she's another 60s super groupie. And that sounds like, I don't know, for some reason, I always feel like groupie has a negative connotation. Like, it's not a nice thing to call someone, but then they self-identify as super I think groupies. in the 60s, there was nothing really bad about... And it was like almost... Like, they were a, the real super groupies. Yeah, it was almost a career for some of them. Like, yeah. they didn't work. And they were also like like a muse? Yes, they were a muse. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. So one of them is Devin Wilson. And she met Jimmy back in 1967. She was, uh, well, at the time identified as bisexual. And she would find women to share her bed with Jimmy. She would put together orgies for him. She would get him whatever drugs he wanted. She was the enabler in chief in that relationship. And she also acts as Jimmy's assistant. She was very, very protective of him and very jealous. And as his celebrity increased, he tried to spend less and less time with her, and she wanted more and more time with him. The song Dolly Dagger was written for her possibly after she threw Jimmy a party for his 27th birthday and then left with Mick Jagger. Danish model and actress Kirsten Neffer. She was dating Jimmy for some time during his last tour and was with him in September of 1970 when he first returned to the UK. But she was filming a movie and she couldn't stay in London, and so she left. That is when Jimmy reconnected with Monica Dannemann. Monica was a 25-year-old German ex-figure skater, and Jimmy had met her during his last tour. He met her after a show, spent, she spent the night with him. He, she then traveled with him until like the next weekend and then went home. So she, he calls her up and he's like, hey, you want to come to London? And she's like, absolutely, I will be on the next flight. And so she came right over. She rented a basement room that was, it was kind of more of like a bed sit, like a, like a studio apartment at the Hotel Samarkand in Notting Hill. And we mentioned it before. Jimmy was absolutely a playboy. There were a lot of women in his life and lots of ladies, you know, happy to spend some sexy time with Jimmy. But what I also find interesting is I'm sure he had one night stands. There's no question about it. But how many, how many women weren't one night stands? Like how many people he saved their contact information and if he was in town or whatever, he'd call them up. And for the most part, they had nice things to say about him. It's like he had a lot of friends with benefits. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. The other thing to talk about is his drug use and quite possibly drug abuse. Linda Keith thinks the first time Jimmy used LSD was with her and she remembers someone offering him acid and he was like, no, 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 thanks, I don't want acid, but do you have LSD? Like, <laughs> he didn't even know that's the same thing, right? Because he was so inexperienced with it. Others don't believe he did acid until the Monterey show, and we know he would occasionally use cocaine or more frequently amphetamines to help keep him awake and barbiturates to help him sleep. But this was pretty common in the 60s, as these drugs were routinely prescribed for all manners of concerns from weight loss to insomnia. And while touring in May of 1969, authorities at the Toronto airport found a small amount of heroin and hash in Jimmy's luggage, and he was charged with drug possession and released on a $10,000 bail. At his trial, he testified that he was frequently given gifts by fans, and he thought that what he had was a legal medication, not heroin. The jury believed him, and he was acquitted. His bandmates and many other musicians at the time believed that this was all a setup, that this had been sort of a conspiracy. 
maybe by the police or other conservative groups. They were trying to make an example of celebrities who were obvious about drug use um, because drug use was on the rise and maybe we can make an example of these people and it'll scare Mm. other people into doing drugs, you know? Some also think it was a stunt by his manager, but we're going to talk about that more a little bit later. There's a lot of people who think Jimmy had a heroin problem. He may have had a fling with Janis Joplin, who was known to have an issue with the drug. Some contemporaries talk of his heroin use. Jimmy himself admitted to using cannabis, hash, LSD, uppers, downers, and occasionally cocaine, but denied ever getting involved in heroin. At his autopsy, there were no needle marks or evidence of past injection sites, which leaves scars. But of course, heroin can also be snorted or smoked. We can't know for sure if he ever used it, but it wasn't in his system when he died. And I think now it's time to talk about the many distortions, rumors, and legends that surround Jimmy's tragic death. On 17th of September, Jimmy and Monica woke up late. Jimmy was exhausted from touring and battling a bug, which many think was the flu. And on top of that, Chelpin, the manager he had signed the bad contract with, was suing him. He had a potential paternity suit to answer to, and he was allegedly trying to change management again and didn't want to deal with Mike Jeffrey anymore. He was frustrated with the music industry, just like Brian Jones. He was always interested in the next thing, the next sound. And he was sick of playing the same set every night on tour. I often wonder that, you know, when we when we go to a concert, I do kind of wonder, like, how sick do these people get of their own music after a while, right? Like, I can't listen to our podcast and we talk about something different every day. I mean, I think day. especially those, like, like classic stars. Yeah. And people just want to hear the old songs over and over and over again. Of and course. And nothing of the new material. Yeah. yeah. That's all we want. Don't play your new material. <laughs> it's true. So some of the last photographs taken of Jimmy are taken in the garden that day by Monica. And Jimmy is holding one of his guitars, one of his favorites that he called Black Beauty. A lot of people, when they look at the photograph, they think he looks tired and puffy, that he doesn't look well. That afternoon, they went shopping, and Jimmy called Kathy Etchingham and asked her to come for a visit that evening. But she had other plans and told him she was sorry, but she couldn't make it, something that she would later regret very much because they were still good friends. They did some more shopping, then they were invited to dinner at a friend's house, but Before they went, they dropped by Jimmy's flat, and he sees Devin Wilson on the street. Monica is not happy when Jimmy jumps out of the car to go talk to Devin, and Devin invites Jimmy to a party at a mutual friend's house later on that night. So they get to friend Philip Harvey's house around 5.30ish. He's got some other friends there, including at least a few lady friends. They have tea, which I assume in this case is dinner in the UK, is often called tea. And uh, they have tea and wine, and they smoke some hash. Monica is getting increasingly unhappy when Jimmy is paying attention to other girls at this dinner who are flirting with him, and she makes an enormous scene. And they have to go outside, and she is just screaming at Jimmy and stressing everyone out in the way only someone who likes to make a scene can. You know those people who, like, honestly, it's like they look forward to it? Oh, yeah. You don't want anybody screaming while you smoked some hash. No. Like, I don't no. ever want anybody screaming Way to kill ever. The mood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Jimmy is really soft spoken. He's a very soft spoken, considerate guy, and he is mortified when their friend has to come out and ask them to keep it down, please. He was the son of like a political bigwig, so he couldn't have, you know, scenes outside his place. So they leave, and back at the apartment, Jimmy takes a bath, and he writes a poem called The Story of Life, which is maybe going to be lyrics for a song he's let, he hasn't written yet. Now it's the early morning hours of September 18th, and a little bit before 2 a.m., Monica drives Jimmy to that party that Devin had invited him to earlier. I say drives him because Monica is not invited to this party, which... That's kind of shitty, actually. I mean, if you're kind of living with somebody and seeing somebody, like, would you go to a party and not have them be there? Anyway. But they're not living together. Well, they're they're not, but they're spending all their time together. Like, they go together to pick up things from his flat and go back to her. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're they're spending all their time together. Yeah, but I think she would have been invited if she wouldn't have been 
Well, anyway, I don't we're going to talk a little bit more yeah. about it later. So Jimmy goes to the party, and while he's there, he takes a black bomber, which is an amphetamine, to stay up, because he's at a party that he arrived to at 2 a.m. Jesus, who are these people? Meanwhile, Monica is, oh, she's pissed. Monica's angry. She has been hanging around outside, and she bangs on the door and is told to come back later. Jimmy's like, tell her, tell her to come back later. So they say, come back later. So she leaves. And then she waits like 15 minutes before coming back and she is just banging on the door again and everyone's telling her to fuck off, but she's demanding to speak with Jimmy. And now other guests are like at the windows yelling at her to fuck off. She's getting fuck off from like every window in the place. And Jimmy is angry and embarrassed by her screaming at him. And so he leaves with her around 3 a.m. So Monica says that then they get home. She made them a couple of tuna sandwiches and they went to sleep or tried to. Jimmy had just taken that amphetamine, and so he was wide awake. He asks Monica if he can have one of her sleeping pills. She's taking these really strong prescription pills called Vesperex, and each pill contained 50 milligrams of Bralobarbital, 150 milligrams of Secobarbital, and 50 milligrams of Hydroxazine. So the first two are barbiturates, and that third ingredient is a really powerful antihistamine that can help with sleep, anxiety, itching, nausea. Her prescription calls for the patient to take one half to one tablet for sleep, so maximum of one. She doesn't give him a sleeping pill, though. She tells him to try to fall asleep on his own, and then, this is such a dick move, uh, apparently at 6 a.m. she snuck a pill when they were both still awake. She says that she then woke up around 10, 10 10.30, and Jimmy was asleep in bed next to her. She then left to get cigarettes, and when she got back at 11 a.m., she found him unresponsive and called an ambulance at 11.18. While waiting for the ambulance, she counted the pills in her bottle of Vesperex and found nine missing. She claimed to have ridden with him in the ambulance and waited outside the hospital, and that the nurse initially told her they thought they could save him and they were working on him, and then the nurse came back to say he had died. Jimi Hendrix was pronounced dead at 12.45 p.m. He was 27 years old. There was an autopsy to determine his cause of death, which was inhalation of vomit due to barbiturate intoxication. So basically, he fell asleep on his back, he vomited and drowned in his own vomit because he had taken 18 times the dose of these strong sleeping pills. His toxicology results showed that he had a blood alcohol level of 100 mg per 100 ml, which is an equivalent to about 4 pints of beer in his system when he died, and also in his system was 20 mg of cannabis. So for comparison, because I know that most people don't know that much about cannabis, that's around the dose of an edible for me that I would take, so it's not a huge amount of cannabis. My guess is he might have smoked something to counteract the amphetamine he took at the party and it didn't work. It could also have been that uh, the hash he smoked earlier would still be showing up in his bloodstream as cannabis, so it could just be left over from that. Yeah, and but he couldn't fall asleep, and he just I think he just took too many sleeping pills. Agreed, and speaking of those sleeping pills, they also found 20 milligrams of that amphetamine and 1.8 grams of barbiturates, so that's way too many. Yeah. Also noted were the lack of any of the marks or scars you see if someone is an intravenous drug user. There wasn't any heroin in his system. The verdict was left open as there was no way to know if the number of pills taken was intentional or accidental. Yeah, Um, it's important to mention that there wasn't heroin in his system is one story that was just completely discredited was er originally Devin Wilson had said that she thought she had intentionally put heroin in his tea and that had accidentally killed him. But that was not, there was no heroin in his system. Jimmy's body was embalmed and flown back to Seattle on 29th of September 1970. He was buried in the same cemetery where his mother was buried, which is Greenwood Cemetery in Renton, Washington. And his funeral was attended by hundreds, including many musical celebrities and his friends. And I'd love to say that this is the story of the life and death of Jimi Hendrix, and, you know, there's nothing left to say. But now we have to dip a toe into the shallow end of the conspiracy theory pool. Yeah, we can't go deep with this, you guys. It would be weeks and weeks. So I guess the first thing to mention is how often Monica's story changed. 
there are a lot of different versions of Monica's story. And she claimed that she and Jimmy were in love, that he was in love with her, and that he had asked her to marry him and she had accepted, and they were engaged. Jimmy isn't around to dispute that, so who can say? In another version of Monica's story, it at least partly explains the suicide theory. So one theory is that Jimmy uh, intentionally ended his life. In another version of events, you hear Monica say Monica woke up, she sees Jimmy unresponsive and covered in vomit, and she calls Eric Burden of the Animals and the band War because her friend was seeing him and she doesn't know what to do. She's just panicking. So instead of calling for help, she calls a friend, and they say, turn him on his side and call for help, call the paramedics. And it seems like she was maybe a little bit reluctant, like she claimed she thought Jimmy would be mad if this created a big fuss or if he got in trouble for drugs. They then say that they rushed over to the hotel and saw Jimmy, and Eric saw the poem he'd written, which ends with the words, quote, The story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. The story of love is hello and goodbye until we meet again, end quote. So he then told the papers that he thought Jimmy had died by suicide because he thought that this was a suicide note. He later blamed the media for misinterpreting what he had said and putting, you know, words into his mouth. But that is, I think, the explanation for the suicide theory. And it's also interesting to note That Eric says that he was there and he says that Monica did not ride to the hospital with Jimmy because she was with him. This seems to back up what the first responders reported and what they reportedly saw totally contradicts what Monica reported. And Kathy Etchingham, who had been Jimmy's girlfriend until his life got to, you know, rock and roll in a very unhealthy way. Uh, She really didn't trust anything Monica was saying, and so she began tracking down people who could maybe shine more light on what had happened. And based on all the fighting and Monica screaming at Jimmy at the two parties the day he died, it made her wonder if perhaps Monica had drugged him just to get him to stay with her, which is actually somewhat... I could see that, you know what I mean? Yes. I'm not saying this what's happened, but it it seems kind of... uh, Yeah, it's not too... Far-fetched, it's not the opinion. most preposterous theory that we're discussing. Yeah. It's not too outlandish. That's n- yeah, no, exactly. and I do think there is definitely a serious mental health issues with with. We'll, we'll talk more about Monica later, but yeah. So Kathy tracked down the first responders for their recollection of events, and the paramedics reported that the door was wide open, but no one was there except for Jimmy, who was on the bed. He was reportedly covered in dried vomit, and it seems he was already dead and had obviously been dead for some period of time before the paramedics arrived. And they said Monica did not go to the hospital with them, they never saw her. So why is Monica such a big part of the story? Yeah, it's interesting because after Jimmy's death, Monica really more or less made a living out of being Jimmy's just bereaved fiance. And Kathy Etchingham had a lot of issues with her behavior. Legacy.com actually sums up what happened better than I could, we could. Quote, Dannemann claimed she and Hendrix had been engaged. Thus began what the Independent termed a 26-year catfight between Dannemann and Etchingham. Dannemann did tons of media interviews, met Hendrix's family in Seattle, traveled to numerous Hendrix conventions, and published a book in 1995 titled The Inner World of Jimi Hendrix, The Real Jimmy, and the Truth About His Death, revealed by his fiancée. His titles, man. It sounds like an old-time newspaper headline. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Where they tell you everything already in the title. Yeah. The quote continues. Meanwhile, Etchingham, who was, who has produced her own memoir through gypsy eyes, maintains that Dannemann had probably known Hendrix only a few days. She criticized the inconsistencies in Dannemann's accounts about the night Hendrix died in 1993, compiled a dossier that raised enough troubling questions to prompt Scotland Yard to reopen the investigation into his death. An enraged Dunneman called Etchingham an inveterate liar, leading to two libel suits, both of which Dunneman lost. End quote. And 
Yeah, let's talk about the rest of the conspiracy theories, I'd say. Yeah. So another popular theory says that Jimmy was murdered by the CIA because they were worried that he would give too much money and too much publicity and sort of credence to the Black Panther Party. Jimmy was more into peaceful protest. He has been quoted as saying, quote, It isn't that I'm not relating to the Black Panthers. I naturally feel part of what they're doing in certain respects. Somebody has to make a move, and we're the ones hurting most, far as peace of mind and living are concerned. But I'm not for the aggression or violence or whatever you want to call it. I'm not for guerrilla warfare, not frustrated things like throwing little cocktail bottles here and there or breaking up a store window. That's nothing, especially in your own neighborhood. I don't feel hate for anybody because that's nothing but taking two steps back, end quote. I think that's interesting, especially when you remember that his childhood was so full of just uncertainty, abuse, addiction, neglect, you know, violence between his parents, just every terrible thing a child could go through, everything. Even in his case, you know, there were reports of sexual abuse. You name it, he suffered it. And I think he really just had enough violence in his life to last a lifetime. You know, I think he was very, very opposed to violence of any kind. And I do think that that his childhood just massively impacted everything from his his dislike of being yelled at by drill sergeants, his inability to to commit to anything for too long, not a woman, not an address, not a style of music, nothing. You know, he was constantly on for the next thing, right? He absolutely did support the civil rights movement, and of course he did. He dedicated music to the Black Panther Party. He made contributions to Martin Luther King. He was part of a tribute concert for King, along with other heavyweights in the music industry at that time. I'm not saying the government wouldn't murder someone for racial reasons. Obviously they would. Operation Chaos was real. And the CIA absolutely spied on and targeted civil rights leaders, anti-war protesters, I just don't think there's enough evidence to think that that's what happened in this case. Yeah, yeah, I think that would have been out of time. I I don't think he was dead involved. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he was either. I think I think he'd have had to get more involved to be seen as more of a threat. Maybe they thought that he would get. Who can say? But maybe, yeah, maybe. Next up is the theory that Jimmy was murdered by the mob. He didn't overdose on pills and aspirate vomit while sleeping. What really happened was he was murdered. And what the killers did was wait until Monica's sleeping pills started to work on her. And once she was asleep, or maybe when she left to get cigarettes, who knows, they give him a few pills and then essentially waterboard him in red wine until he drowned in it. This rumor was bolstered by a doctor who was working at the hospital where Jimmy died. He was quoted as saying that he was full of red wine, his clothes and hair were saturated with it, and it kept coming up when they were suctioning his airway. Yet there's no mention of wine anywhere in the autopsy findings, only that vomit was found in the lungs and a partly digested meal that included rice was in his stomach. Surely, if he had been soaked in red wine, that would have come up at some point, at least. And Jimmy died in 1970, but his doctor didn't come forward until another book was published in 2009 by a former roadie for the animals, James Tappy Wright. So let's talk about what Tappy had to say, because this all circles back to him. According to Tappy's book, which is called Rock Roadie, about a year after Hendrix died, Michael Jeffrey confessed to murdering Jimmy because Jimmy was going to leave him and with a 2 million insurance policy Jeffrey had on Hendrix, he'd be worth more to him dead than alive. This theory is intense. It's got tentacles. There's so much here. And it just ties back to so many other things. It's a lot. Uh, Yeah. We're going to try to keep it short and simple, so essentially people who believe this theory think Jeffrey had built Jimmy's recording studio in New York City, and in doing so, allegedly borrowed some money from the local mafia. The first time people who believe this theory think that Jeffrey harmed Hendrix to help himself was actually the drug bust in Toronto. Remember that one? People there at the time thought it was bizarre how rehearsed the situation was and said the band had been told that they'd be searched. So they believed that the drugs were planted on Hendrix. So, you know, he would be arrested and Jeffrey could be the hero to get him bailed out. So Jimmy could see how much he needed him. The second event they point to is the one we haven't mentioned yet. The kidnapping of Jimi Hendrix. Bum, bum, bum. 
So the story goes that in late 1969, looking to buy drugs, Hendrix ends up being kidnapped by some guys in a mob, and they want some of what Jimmy is earning, which isn't a lot anyway, but... They call Michael Jeffrey with their demands and he in turn sends some bigger mob guys to get Jimmy back and beat up the guys who took him. Some think it was all a setup by Jeffrey to make Jimmy see how much he needed the manager. You know, he was just talking about leaving. But it all backfired because if it was true, Jimmy never spoke of it or remembered it. And we really aren't sure if he was ever really kidnapped. It's so bizarre. I think it's because it's so hard to uh, to verify facts about his life. So it makes it a lot easier to perpetuate myths about what happened, right? It's easier to buy into a conspiracy if it's really hard to disprove the conspiracy. And there's so much hearsay. And everyone who has a story to tell about what happened, for the most part, they also have a horse in the race. Sometimes it's really simple, like having blinders on for a lost love, like maybe Kathy has, which it's, you know, maybe just unconscious bias. But other times, a lot of books were written, like a lot of tell-all books were written. They all told a different story, but they're the kind of book that does well if there's more of a scandal, aren't they? So I don't know. I just, I think there are people who knew that their actions sort of directly contributed to Jimmy's death. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. So that that's but those are all the those are the conspiracy theories. Hopefully we've debunked them. I mean, we can't really debunk them or confirm them. No. It's just But we've given alternative explanations, yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay, a couple of last things we want to mention. Uh we want to mention Devon Wilson. Once one of his closest confidants and lovers, uh Jimmy had started to distance himself from her when, you know, her, her drug use, her heroin and cocaine use was increasing. And when Jimmy died, she was devastated. Her drug use increased. And on 2nd of February 1972, she had a fatal fall from the Chelsea Hotel, the same hotel where Sid Wishes killed Nancy Spungen. And nobody knows if it was accidental or intentional. On 5th of March 1973, two airliners en route to London Heathrow Airport collided in mid-air over Nantes in France. All 68 people on board the DC-9 were killed, including Michael Jeffrey, who was nine days shy of his 40th birthday. So he can't answer for the claims by others that he had Jimmy killed. You know, the theory that we find rather unlikely, but it's a very popular theory. And the next death is Monica. The second lawsuit Monica Dannemann lost to Kathy Etchingham was in 1996. And two days after the verdict, she died by suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. She was 50 years old. Her partner, Uli John Roth of the Scorpions, believes she was murdered as part of the conspiracy to cover everything up. And he's not alone in thinking that. Yeah, I think a lot of people really do believe that, you know, foul play was involved. But I think a lot of people, I think both of us agree that maybe Monica was somewhat deluded. As to the nature of her relationship with Jimmy, I think she was a, just a huge fan who saw a future that was never there. I wonder if he was the kind of guy, because you do hear a lot that he had girls claiming he they were his fiance, And I wonder if he, if he does like me sometimes, like if someone does something nice for me, I'm like, marry me. But they were like, yes, <laughs> we're engaged. I think maybe it was that kind of, it's hard to know. I know that friends of his reported being just appalled at the way she treated him, but she's also not here to mm. defend herself. Yeah. I think, you know, we, we see this over and over, but I, I do think the simplest explanation is that I think in the past, Jimmy had been told by doctors just to take an extra sleeping pill for his own use. And you watch a lot of interviews with his friends and other band People at the time clapped in different, you know, guys at the time, and they'll say, oh, you know, if I took one hit of acid, Jimmy took three. You know, he always they always said he was always in excess of things. And maybe he just didn't know how strong these particular pills were. And I think he, I think he did just overdose and suffocate on his own vomit. I do think the same. I think it was an accidental overdose and he, he suffocated. Yeah. But also, there are some things where I think Monica might have had a hand in it not that she that she did something on purpose but by accident and she tried to cover it up because in my opinion you come home from getting cigarettes you find the man you just spent the night with 
in bed, unresponsive. She calls the ambulance 18 minutes later. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, she goes and counts her sleeping pills, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, in my opinion. That's something you would maybe do later. Yeah. I think that she might have told him, hey, if you can't, you know, unwind, if you have problems sleeping, there are my sleeping pills. Oh, maybe. I really don't think... This was this was a time, an era where people were very... In, in that, you know, musician, artist community, very freely oh, indulging. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, for in, sure. Yeah. Whatever. And I don't think, I don't think she told him, no, you can't have a sleeping pill. I'm, sh I think she told him there are the sleeping pills. If you can. she went to bed, take a sleeping pill if you can't sleep. Yeah. I think you're probably, and she lied about saying don't take one because she thought she'd get in trouble. Yeah. Because she would have been blamed, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. People would blame her, which maybe not fair, but obviously people who, who love him or admire him would blame her. And she really probably didn't want to go through that. Yeah. That's all just my interpretation of things, right? I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, I wondered that. The only thing I wondered about is, I feel like if, if it were me, but then, you know, everybody reacts differently. If I felt like I was really legitimately somewhat responsible, then would I want to stay so close to the case? Like, would I want to make the rest of my life about what happened? Or she but just, if you're kind of delusional, and well, you, this is you, it. Yeah, you think you played a way more important role in yeah. his life than you actually did. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yep, yeah. that's it. That's the only thing. I really don't think she denied him a sleeping pill. No, I, I don't really think don't. she did either. She she claimed she did, but I agree with you. I don't think she did. I don't think she would have denied him anything. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. 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 I do wonder. I could see her drugging him a little bit. I don't know. I could see a sort of... But this was, was a lot of pills. was a lot of pills. Well, it was. And then the other thing is that the paramedics said that he he appeared to be dead for a while already. Yeah. And yeah, she, yeah. she claimed she left at 10.30, returned yeah. at 11. He would have been dead for, what, 30 minutes? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's not what a paramedic would call dead for a while. No. And I, I one of the things I read nothing. said that... Yeah, said that the whole the whole story about sucking all the vom the wine out of his system was obviously a lie because like all the all the liquid had dried so they couldn't really yeah you know they couldn't there was nothing they could do he had clearly been dead for quite some time yeah so yeah i agree with you it's just sad it's just so unfortunate and i think she might have woken up found him in in bed like that mm -hmm. panicked left thought about what to do Return mm. or maybe I think she left because people, you know, it's an alibi. I left yeah. the room, came back. He was dead. Yeah, it could be. Who knows? <laughs> it's all just speculation yeah. at this point. Yeah, one of the things that I didn't really understand until we did this episode, which I do understand now, is you hear how he's always like Hendrix is just held up as this incredibly talented guitar player and one of the things i came to understand was it wasn't so much how good he was because obviously he was good it was just he completely revolutionized the way the instrument was used like he used a wah-wah pedal you know he he just revolutionized the sound of it i guess yep. took it in a whole other direction and he had all these plans like he'd been talking to brian jones he'd been talking to miles davis he had plans for the next the next big thing, the next sound, and it's just sad. Just sad. I really don't think that it was suicide. I really don't no, see I don't a either. reason why. I mean, you can never know, but I no. really... Well, I there were also think. something like... Weren't there like... There were like 40 pills still in the bottle. Like, it was a pretty new prescription that she had. So, yeah. I, I think the thought was like she had taken one, and there were nine others missing. So... Yeah, yeah. I think that's why the, the coroner left the verdict open because if you if your intent was to end things, why wouldn't you take all the pills? To be sure. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You wouldn't. Why? You wouldn't leave most of the pills and just take. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's just sad. No. It's. You know, I always remember in college. You know, anytime somebody I thought was too drunk going around the dorm room like a lunatic trying to prop everyone up on their side in case they got sick. No, but, it's really important. And that's it also is. the thing with with combining drugs. Like I I know people take cocaine or any other kind of upper, and then you want to go to bed and 
Yeah. Smoking a joint doesn't do anything for you, so you take other things. And it's really, really dangerous that the mix is. of drugs. Yeah, yeah. Like John Belushi, I mean. Or how many people take drugs with alcohol, you know, swallowing yeah, pills exactly. with alcohol yeah. is... Mm -mm. Well, and we will, as we continue on with the 27 Club, we will have, I think, a couple of accidental... Um, like Keith yeah. Ledger, we lost that way, didn't we? Accidental combination of drugs. So... Be safe, everybody, please. You have something good? I did. It was my, well, it was my birthday. And um, so I am 45. Thank you all for the lovely wishes. Um, that was nice. And yeah, we've just been really busy with painting and medical stuff and getting ready for family visiting. How about you? I mean, my something good is still that my husband was home. We had, I have to say, this vacation was the nicest one we had in the last two years, you know, ever since my dad That's so great. moved on. Yeah. It was just a lot of being next to each other and being just happy. Mm -hmm. We didn't stress ourselves out to go visit family. We didn't stress ourselves out to see friends. Uh, we had friends come over for barbecue and we visited my mom. But other than that, we were just, just the two of us together and... That's nice. I just love it when he's next to me doing his thing and I'm watching my German soap opera and he's just making these funny comments on the side. It's, it was it was really, really good. <laughs> it was really good. A little, a little normalcy back in your life for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah much needed. Nice. It feels like it was the first time in two years that this dark cloud is not constantly there. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> That's something to celebrate for sure. All right. If you liked this episode or any of our other episodes, our whole podcast or maybe just a half of it, we don't care. Please go and check on your podcast app if you can leave us a rating and or review. We truly, truly appreciate it. Anne is so close to her goal of 1000 ratings on iTunes USA. We're getting there. <laughs> it's exciting. Come say hello in our Facebook group. If you're on Facebook, search for Fresh Hell Podcast Murder. We will be posting photographs and different things related to this case, like we do with every case. You'll find them in our albums. Come say hi. If you are interested in other information about us, check out our website, which is freshhellpodcast.com. That's where you'll find out our email address, our post office box, places to listen, links to buy our merch. You can go to patreon.com and search Fresh Hell Podcast, and they will tell you what our different tiers of membership are. Do we have the date for the next game 26th night? of uh, May. 26th of May, yes. It's going to be great. For our murder tier. Oh, I have to put together, I took some screenshots last time so I could do a little guide to, head, to playing. So I'm going to put that together. Perfect. But yeah, come say hi. We'd love it. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and don't only tell us hi, please. Tell your pets hi. Tell them we love them. Tell them we miss them. Hug them, cuddle them, feed them, treat them nicely. Take them to the vet if they need it. We've just been to the vet with Leela because she is the laziest dog in the world and we just wanted to make sure that her little heart is all intact and in order and everything is fine. She's just really unbelievably lazy. But hey, it is what <laughs> it is. I think she had a hard life before she got to you guys. Yeah, she just like, wants to I think relax. She spent a lot of time like scared and on the run, and now yeah. she's like, "Fuck it! If you need me, I'll be on my pillow, bitch. <laughs> Call me when my dinner's ready." She has my. Like I want that. her life. Yeah. Uh, please be also uh, kind to your fellow human being, and be kind to yourself. And that's it. That's all for this week. Yes. And as always, please remember that if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. It'll get better. Bye.